Good morning, everybody. I heard to Neil, I think. Sorry, I got these. I don't hear too well. It's so good to be with all of you here this morning. Um, I'm so glad that we can gather together as a as a local church in this place under the name of God to celebrate Him, to give Him thanks, to give Him praise, because He is worthy. I don't know if you have been get, um, journeying with us with the, the, the prayer guide that, that was available from last week. If you don't have one, you can pick one up. But um, today, this morning, it's, it's like the authority and the majesty of God. To Him is the power, the glory, and forever and ever, amen. It's under that name, under His name we gather. It's fantastic. Uh, I should say my good, my good morning. Um, my name's Brendan. And we're all going to be worshiping this morning. So glad to have people online, whether they're in the car. If I'm with my kids, I often run late. Sorry. But we listen when we're in the car on the way here. That's awesome. Um, so if you're in the room online, um, it's so good to gather together. I'm going to invite you to stand. One of the ways we're going to worship Jesus this morning is through music and song. We're going to join in the joy of praising Jesus. If you're a 10 o'clock person, that is, you don't wake up until 10. That's okay. We're going to join in the joy now. So I invite you to stand. It's joy comes in the morning, but we are, there's a lot of joy in praising Jesus. I'm going to join us to lift his name high. Feel the people 
celebrate in his name. We can see that God's moving, mighty river through the nation. Here we see that God's moving, time of jubilee is coming. And we can see that God's moving, mighty river through the nation. And we can see that God's moving. The time of Jubilee is coming With young and old and turn to Jesus We fling wide to heavenly gates Prepare the way of the risen Lord Open up the doors and let the music play Let the is the one who dwells in the name of the Lord and blessed is the name of the Lord
upon you. We direct our ears to you. We want to hear from you, Jesus. We know that you are here. We know you draw near to us. Lord, help us be attentive to you. We give you our hearts. We give you our minds. We give you our bodies, our attention. We surrender our will to you, Jesus. Just before the kids get too settled, today is our last Sunday of our Vacation Kids Life program. So kids, this is your chance to grab, get up, grab all you need and head on out to our Kids Life program. This is the last one for the vacation. Next week, we start kicking off the normal Kids Life program and curriculum. So the kids can make their way out now. Also, while the kids are doing that, you may want to check in on the QR code up there to let us know that you're here today. And if you're online, here's your chance to click in and let us know that you're online as well today. 
Um, and also there's an opportunity there on that screen also to indicate your giving as well um, for when you're wanting to pro promote and develop further this, the work that we're doing here in this community. Um, my name's Evan and I had the privilege of hosting this all through this morning. But there's some interesting stuff that's coming up and there's some really significant things in the life of our church and in our college. And I'll get to that one in a moment. Um, if you're... We've got to keep up to date with all these screens. If you've got the blue, see the blue shirts and you're new here and you're not sure where to go, what to do, um, grab someone in a blue shirt. They'll be happy to help you out on what you're needing to do or find or get to. Um, likewise, too, if you've got little ones um, that didn't go out to our Kids Life program this morning, there is a family room, um, parents retreat out the back as well that you can avail of and the services stream there so that you don't miss out on anything happening there as well. And if you are new, uh, welcome. And there's also an opportunity for you to get a free coffee at the end of the service today. So let them let the team know at the coffee cart that you're new. Um, and I know that there was a time where a few people were uh, regular attenders who would also go out and say that they were new to try and get a free coffee. Um, I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Um, but there are... Um, the coffee team will be quite happy to help you with you being new here because they'll know that you're new. That's a hint for those that wanting to hit up Eddie for another one. Um, <coughs> so that's all that part. Um, also, there's a whole lot of information on our uh, ch church socials and e-news. Um, if you're not part of that already, please click in and connect in with that. Um, there will be a lot of things starting to ramp up as our year starts to commence. Um, so it'll be really important that if you're wanting to be part of the first sessions or first events, um, that you're up to date on all that information. So please make sure you're part of our e-news um, or checking in on our socials. Tomorrow um, is a fairly significant thing in the life of our college. Um, this year is the 40th year that the college has been in existence, which is pretty special and pretty unique. Um, so tomorrow morning, there's actually, I think it's 11.15, I haven't got my guy, 11.45. Um, in our auditorium tomorrow, all of the Calvary team will be gathering here. Um, and it'll be a very important time of resetting for 2024, but also to look at where we've been in the last 40 years. I know Sherilyn, she was, she's over there, um, has a tremendous plan laid out for t the team for this year. Um, and later on in the service this morning, we're actually going to take time out to pray for the seats and the staff that will be sitting in these seats tomorrow. Um, as we go through such a significant milestone, because 40 years is really important. So that's on tomorrow morning. That's here in the auditorium at 11.45. Um, tomorrow night uh, at 7 p.m., um, as part of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, we've got another worship night coming up. Um, and we're also reminded, too, that there are uh, prayer meetings at 6 a.m., um, Six till seven, yeah, six till seven, um, except on Sundays, both in person and online, so you could be part of that. The uh, Brendan mentioned the prayer guide earlier this morning uh, in our service, so if you haven't got one of those, make sure you grab one of those on your way out this afternoon or this morning. This afternoon, boy, it's one of those. It looks green one like that one over there, um, and that's a, there's one of those available for every single person. So if you're, uh, I think it was mentioned last week about that. Oh, look, we'll only need one for our household you can take one for each person in your household. So please make sure you they're already printed, they're already done, all ready to go. So grab one of those on your way up. And then in two weeks' time, we've, yeah, two weeks? Yeah, two weeks' time, then we've also got our whole tribe leaders meeting. So this is a really significant night as well, that if you're part of our church community and you have some form of leadership, and those of you that have been in our community for a while will know that uh, as a GLS host, uh, if you have influence, you're a leader. So in other words, that's all of us. Whether we have influence in our households, in our relationships, um, or whether we take a more visible, significant, upfront leadership role, either way, we have an opportunity to come and really focus in on what's going to be happening in the life of our church over this next 12 months. Um, and Adam and Claire will give us some, some clarity around, okay, what directions we might be heading in this next little while. Um, so if you're a leader, which is all of us, um, please put that into your calendars so that you're available for that 29th of January on that particular night. How am I going? 
nearly there? Yeah, I'm ticking them off. Okay, so we're getting there. We're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer as we prepare to hear the message that Adam's going to be bringing. So let's spend some time praying. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have brought us here today. We're here for a purpose. Help us to really focus in on what it is that you're wanting to say to us today. We've reflected on all the great things that we've been thankful and having tremendous gratitude for what had happened in one of our earlier services this year. Help us to put you first. And help us to put the right things in the right order. To put those things that should be first, first. And so, Father, that's you. So, Lord, keep it very in the front of our minds and very central in our thinking that you're first. And help us, Lord, to keep you in that rightful place. All glory, all honour, and all praise to you. And Father, we pray for Adam as he brings the message this morning. Use him, speak through him, and help all of us to be truly attentive to your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seven. Well, good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Adam and I have the great privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Real Life Christian Church. Before I jump into the message, I just thought, why don't you get up and say good day to someone you haven't seen for a while or you might actually come across someone who's new and uh, you can just make them feel welcome. Uh, and so why don't we do that just for a few moments and uh, you might see a really cool cap somewhere in the vicinity of our, I'm just, it's like a Where's Wally type of experience for you. If you see a really cool cap somewhere around the auditorium, just compliment the person on the cap. All right, so why don't you just get up, say day to someone. We're just so glad you're here. We want you to feel welcome, so move around. Okay, why don't, we, why don't we come together, find our seats. As, uh, as Evan mentioned earlier, we are in the midst of our summer message series where we're having a look at first things first. This idea of first things first. Now, you could be easily um, you, you know, confused about this idea because the great challenge for us in modern Western society is around what, what actually takes priority. What, 
what is a priority in our life. I don't know about you, but in the whirlwind of life, uh, everything seems to be urgent and important. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. A bill comes in. That's urgent. It's important. Uh, this person uh, called me with a, you know, um, a need or a request or, or, you know, because we're so technologically connected and we can be communicated with like, like all the time by stuff, it all seems urgent and what's a priority? And in fact, something that's taken place in, in kind of only the last maybe 100 years or so is that this word priority emerged in the English language in the 1400s. It wasn't around before that and suddenly we have this word priority. And for the next 500 years, priority was only in singular form. In other words, we can discover a priority, meaning it has priority. There's one most important thing. And then somewhere in the 1900s, we pluralized it, and we can have priorities. Isn't that really interesting? Have you ever thought about that? I have multiple things that are all equally more important than other things. So if they're all important, nothing's important. Do do you know what I'm saying? This whole challenge of what really does come first. What is actually, in fact, most important? Not more important, most important. And if we look at the definition of priority... A priority, it's a noun. And it means the quality or state of coming before another in time or importance. If something has priority, it comes first in our attention, in our energy, in our focus. Or it is a condition of being given attention before others. So this whole idea of first things first for us as a church here at Real Life as we begin our year is about let us be reminded of what really comes first for real life, both for our church and for experiencing the fullness of the real life that Christ has made possible for us in real life. Yeah. Now, we actually see that God makes clear a sense of priority for us in his story with humanity. And we go all the way back to the book of Genesis and we can see hints of how he has made it clear about what priority should be, about how, if we're thinking about first things first, about what should come first. And if we go to Genesis chapter 4, we see the first kinds of acts of worship starting to emerge in God's relationship or, or mankind's, humankind's relationship with God. And We see this in Genesis chapter 4. Now, Abel, these are one of the sons of Adam and Eve, he kept flocks, so he's a farmer, he's a shepherd, tends animal. Any other shepherds here? Any other? I don't know, we've got some people around the place who are connected with that kind of thing. So they're able to keep flocks. Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So also a farmer dealing with crops. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Notice it says there, in the course of time. Like it just, you know, like, when he got around to it, Cain brought stuff to God in offering of worship. Yeah? But notice this. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, I mean, like the best of an animal, right? Like the best part of an animal. He's bought the good bits, the best bits, and from some of the firstborn of his flock. So as the flock multiplies, then the firstborn from a, from a sheep or, or, or whatever the animal might be, he's bringing that and the best of to God. Can you see the difference the, in the course of time, what I can bring? And then the no, as a priority, God receives this offering. And we see this reality. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And why is that? Is that because God's overly particularly fussy about the offering? Like, well, I, I prefer meat over, like, that would be me if I was God. I'm like, thanks for the fruit and veg, but like, bring me some steak. I'm happy, right? But God's not Adam. Thank you, Lord, for that. Hey, and, and God is, the issue's the matter of the heart, right? So Abel brought an offering that was like, I want you to have the first and I want you to have the best. 
Cain brought an offering that was like, when I get around to it, you can have some stuff, God. See the difference? God seems to have been moved by this idea of being the priority. I want to put to you, friends, that to live out the fullness of the real life that God has for you, God must be first. It is actually his creative design for humankind that we might live with that reality, that God must be first. He wants to be first in our lives, in the orientation of our heart. He wants to be that way. Now, I don't think, looking across this particular auditorium and not really knowing who's online, but so good to have you with us, that there'd be many people here who are going, that is a shocking thought. I've never even thought about that. Because actually, when you read the scripture, you can see there's this orientation. God wants to be worshipped. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. He's the creator of the universe. And you and I are not. And so the natural response from us should be, I'm just, I need you. You're amazing. Look at what you've done for me. You're incredible. You are the Savior. You are the Messiah. You, you know, that is an appropriate response for someone that went to hell and back for you. You know, this, this is important. But the reality is, as I mentioned before, that we get all kinds of challenges about priorities. And God's saying, I don't want to be one of your priorities. I want to be your priority. Challenging, isn't it? We're in a season here at Real Life of prayer and fasting, and as Claire explained to us, what, the reason we do that is fasting is about disconnecting from other things that we think are kind of really important to us, but we know really are not. And the prayer part is about then, after having disconnected here, we're also then connecting to God and the things of God as a priority in that season. And whatever you're fasting and then saying, God, you're more important than that. I mean, it's kind of that simple. And making space in our lives for him to meet us in that place. That God must be first. Have a think about this. We've just come out of Christmas. Did you enjoy Christmas? I really enjoyed our services, he says somewhat biasly. Um, it was great. We're really blessed. And, and in the services, if you were here on Christmas Eve, you might uh, recall we, we saw this image, I'm literally using the same image, of, of the manger you know, as, as the centerpiece of a nativity scene. Yeah. And the invitation was, come and draw near. Come and, come and enter in. You know, we've arrived at the arrival of the Messiah when we think about Christmas, a come and, and draw in. But can you imagine if, when we actually think about the nativity scene, if we changed it around? Do you know, and instead of the manger being at the center, we put the shepherds first. Like they were in the middle and the manger just off to the side. You know, and the shepherds kind of might symbolize like your work, the work that you do. And we go, look, in this nativity, like my work is front and center and Jesus is just over here to the side. It just doesn't feel right, does it? You look at the nativity and you go, why are the shepherds in the middle? That doesn't seem right. Or what if, we, what if, you know, what if I came out here and I, I said, here's this beautiful nativity and I'm just going to take the wise men and put them in the center and we'll just move the manger over here. And the wise men, that might be your wealth. You know, they brought these expensive gifts to worship the, the Messiah. And that, that's your work, you know, like oh, my work's so important, it gets a whole lot of my energy and my time, it fills my heart and, and uh, you know, that's actually pretty front and center. It just seems like a weird nativity, doesn't it? Or what if we grabbed Mary and Joseph and we just put the manger behind them? I mean, you know, they're mum and dad, right? They're pretty important. We put them in the front and the manger's just kind of over here. And we put Mary and Joseph first in the nativity. You know, what that means is like we're putting our family first. And that kind of sounds right, doesn't it? That kind of sounds like, what are you saying, Adam? You're starting to mess with something sacred to me. My family does come first. And God would say, your family's important, but I come first. In fact, if you put me first, it's better for your family. So if you really think your family's important, you'll put me first. Do you know what I mean? We do this, right? We go, ah, oh, here's my priorities and all these important things, but we don't quite know how to differentiate, which, by the way, is really stressful, right? When everything's a priority. And God's saying, I didn't create you for stress. I created you for clarity and purpose. What about if we move the nativity around and we put the manger to the side and we brought all the animals in the front? And some of you are like, yes! I love my pets. I love my dog. I love my fur babies. You know, you know like some of you are like, you love them a lot. Like, 
But let's say that's like pets and things and hobbies and maybe other things you do, things that you enjoy. And you go, no, no, they're front and center in my life. And God's saying, there's nothing wrong with those things. But no, no, I'm first. In fact, when God actually leads humanity to this point in his grand story in the Bible where we see that that God um, raises up a nation, uh, is about to establish Israel, they end up in slavery in Egypt, and God intervenes through Moses and he releases them and they spend some time getting to know who God is, and God starts to say, let me help you figure out how to live. When he gets to the point where he's saying, here are some commandments, in the Ten Commandments, we read the very first commandment makes very, very clear how God feels about life for us if we're thinking about first things first. We read this in Exodus chapter 20. God says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other. Interestingly, Pastor Chris Hodges uh, wrote a book called Pray First, and we're leaning pretty heavily on his great work in this. You know, he makes this point. You notice that God's commandment here doesn't say you can't have other gods, small g. In other words, you can't have other things that you love and cherish. It just says, God says, they can't come before me. Do you understand? So I must be first. You can have other things that you hold dear and love and cherish. It is okay that Pastor Adam loves basketball. And there was a time in my life, as some of you will know, when it was my priority and came before everything else. And God is saying, Adam, it's fine that you love basketball, but it cannot come before me. And let me tell you, my experience has been that life is so much better when that priority is sorted out. Interesting, hey? You shall have no other gods for me. I just need to come first for you. And interestingly, it's not that God needs your and my attention. It's not that he has a deficit of, like, I don't feel loved because my people aren't looking to it. This is not God. He's not insecure. The great gift of this is he says, I need you to put me first because actually that's what's best for you. I've done this for you. I'm making this a requirement for you that you might thrive and flourish as a human being, that you would put me first in your heart and in your life. God has to come first. And here's the thing. He actually models that heartbeat for us because if we think about this reality, this this kind of, I've come, I'm the guy. He starts with, here's what I've done for you, therefore put me first. He says, this is what I did for you. I brought you out of slavery. I've brought you into a life of freedom and promise. And if we extrapolate that out into the fullness of God's mission and plan on the earth, he sends his own son, Jesus. He sends his first and his best to bring us out of slavery. He says, this is what I've done, so therefore put me first. It's not about what you need to do. He's not saying, hey, you need to do stuff so you can be okay and and find righteousness somehow. He's saying, look at what I've done. I've done this for you to put me first because actually that's where fullness of life is found. It's pretty cool, right? God loves you so much that he wants fullness of life for you and for me. So he says, put me first because that's how you'll find it. That's how you experienced it. He takes the initiative. You know, John wrote about it in, in 1 John chapter 4. He says this, we love because God first loved us takes the initiative. He says, I've put you first. You take the same response and put me first. Now, how do we do that? How do we put God first? Because I know it can be a challenge, right? I live in a whirlwind just like you. I get text messages, even on my day off. Thank you, people that text me on my day off. I get stuff all the time with people wanting to you know, like you in any job or any life or any family, you know, the stuff comes up and you think, wow, this is important. This has got to happen. This has got to happen in a sequence of all these demands. And how do we, you know, create a culture in our heart and our life that continues to draw us back to this idea of putting God first? And, and I want to put to you this, that we put God first by giving him the first of everything. In our life, we give him the first of everything. And as we journey through this series, we're going to have a look at a few things that need to be first things first. It's not everything, but the few things that we think are really, really important as we begin our year, as we establish rhythms here at Real Life in our life together and our life scattered. What are some things that we can be 
giving to him first that set us up for the fullness of life that he desires for us. You know, in Proverbs, we read this in the message version. It says, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. You see, God is an everything God. He's an every, he, wants, he wants everything of you. He loves you so much. He wants everything of you. He wants all of you and all that you can give, all that you are. He loves you. He wants fullness of everything. He doesn't just want a couple of hours on Sunday. He wants your everything. He's an all-in God. He doesn't just want bits of your life. He wants your whole life. Can I just say this? Just You and I were not created to spend our lives in the shallow end of life's pool. God has said, I've got an ocean for you to swim in. Don't settle for being ankle deep. I've got an ocean for you to swim in. Don't settle for just being up to your knees. I've got an ocean of life and blessing and and relationship and intimacy with me. Don't settle for even just getting up to your shoulders. He says, go all in. Give me everything. Give me everything. So I actually think it's really important, friends, that we give due consideration to putting first things first. Because in that is fullness of life. And that is what we desire for everyone. Our vision here at Real Life is that we would see more people knowing real life in Jesus. Fullness of life. And the fullness of that life is not a life where Jesus is like fries on the side of our main meal. It's where we say, Jesus, you are the meal. So with that in mind, we need to pray first. Pray first needs to be a response in our lives. We need to pray first. This is one of the things we should do. Here at Real Life, one of our core values is being immersed in prayer. We think it is like to us spiritually the way that breathing air is to us physically. Prayer is like the spiritual air we breathe. It is the conduit of communication through which we engage with the creator of the universe. So we should pray first. If that is true, then prayer should be uh, our first response and it should come often for us. And Chris Hodges says this, he goes, well, sometimes prayer is the only thing we can do. It is always the best thing we can do. And too often prayer becomes our last resort, but God wants prayer to be our first response. Come to me first. Our pray first is saying, God, you're first. I I, I need you in this. It's an acknowledgement that we actually need God to move and we actually need God's uh, supply and we need God's um, presence and we we need God. We need you first. So we can learn to pray first. We're in this season of prayer and fasting because we want to set that habit in our lives. And and if you haven't picked up a little uh, uh, green wristband, uh, on it it says pray first. It's a beautiful reminder. I can't tell you how often this week I found myself just playing, fidgeting with it. (laughs) Is anyone else a fidgeter with stuff? You know, I don't normally have this on my body and I'm fidgeting with it now. Is anyone like that? And, uh, and also, just as an aside, I don't normally wear a watch anymore because my, my phone is my watch. And I have looked at this green band hoping it will tell me the time more times than you. Because it feels like, you know, I'm like, wait, it's not the time. But in doing that, I go, oh, wait, pray first. And it reminds me to pray first. So every time I've gone to try and tell the time this week, I've started to pray. That's a lot in a day, let me tell you. Short prayer times. It's a great reminder. Pray first. Pray first. Prayer is a beautiful gift to us that God has given. Again, it's not for his benefit. It's for ours. And prayer has been a journey for me. I'm an activist. I like to do stuff. And I don't know if this is just personality, temperament, or that I'm a bloke. I don't know, with all the stereotypes of that, I like to fix stuff too. It's a problem. I can fix it. And so I too often live this last resort prayer life than first response prayer life. And it's been a journey for me over 20-something years to go, actually, if I can, and it's a work in progress, pray first. Then actually I find things go better. I get clarity. I get opportunity that I, I wouldn't see because God's going, hey, hey, I've got the fullness of heaven's resources available for you. Pray first. Prayer does some great things. Prayer does this. It connects us with God. So important. Prayer connects us with God. And God is love. Prayer draws us back to the source of security and identity 
and strength of that, a foundation on which to build. And Paul writes about the nature of how unfathomable and inseparable that reality is. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says this to us, the great apostle. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves you. So when we create a habit or a discipline of putting prayer first, it's not earning more love from God. It's actually just accessing the love he already has for you. It's being reminded in that relationship of his orientation towards you. He loves you. He loves you in a way that you cannot be separated from it. You can't botch it. You can't wreck it. You can't disconnect it. He loves you. Friends, if you remember nothing else from today, walk away with that truth in your heart. He loves you. So pray first. Connect with God regularly. Access that truth on a regular basis. I'm loved. He loves me. He's a good God. And like any good father, he wants to give good things. He wants to meet with you. Pray first. Because it connects us with God. Pastor Chris Hodges says, The goal of being focused. I don't even know what that is. The goal of being focused and committed to prayer is relationship, not religion. So I, I, I'm talking deep into the pool stuff today, friends. This is not about, here's stuff I do so God loves me. This is, we're not talking anything today about what it means to be saved or getting saved. Salvation can be assured. You can be saved and live your life at the shallow end of God's pool. We'll see you in heaven. It's just God will go, Man, I had so much more for you. Why did you settle for so little of me and the things I had for you? Why did you settle for that? We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about earning anything. We're, this prayer guide that we have for you, this is not a here's some stuff to do so you're more holy. That's not what it is. This is just a tool that you can use to help you access all that God has for you that he's already done and made possible. That's all spiritual disciplines are. That's all any of these resources are. Friends, the goal of being focused and committed to prayer is relationship with God. Not religion. How are you going with that? What a great truth. Here's the other thing that prayer does for us. Prayer overcomes anxiety and fear. Does anyone struggle with that? I know I do. From time to time, I find myself worrying about some things or I get super... Um, Fearful is probably too strong a word, but I, I, I fear the worst of a scenario. I'm a scenario person, so if we're engaging with anything, I've already thought about 16 different ways it might go, and then depending on what happens, I just pick the one that, you know what I mean? I'm learning to pray first, and then I don't have to have 16 scenarios. I can just go, God's got a plan. I'll just work with that one. <laughs> Prayer overcomes anxiety and fear. Again, the great apostle Paul who understood how much God loves us. He wrote about it in Romans. He has this to say in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 4. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? He's saying, come and connect with me. Connect with God. Pray. Give him all of your anxieties and your fears, and here's what will happen. In that relationship, being reminded of all that God is, of his resources, of his capacity, of his love for you, in light of those truths, his peace will flow to you on the matters that you are anxious about. I've got to tell you, I've experienced this too often to count. That when I have wondered what I should do, and you can be anxious about positive things. I'm going to give you an example. About nine and a half years ago, God, should we uproot our entire family, move away from all of our existing family, and move to another state? Let me tell you, that raised some fear and some anxiety. And so we prayed. Hey, God, your will be done in us and through us. And brought it to the Lord and we were reminded that he loves us and we remind that he has a good plan and we are reminded that even if we go to another place, he provides us family. We experience the peace of God. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have all of the, that doesn't mean that all of the answers to our questions get answered. It just means we know that 
we are in close proximity and relationship with the one who has all the answers. Prayer helps us to overcome fear and anxiety. Prayer also empowers us to live supernaturally. It's like the invitation that we have on a regular basis to pull our chair up to the banquet table of the king. And it's like God has this banquet for us in his kingdom and he says, come and eat all of this. I have all of this available for you. And it's like us saying, no, no, I can't. I, I can't do that. I'm on a carb-free diet. God, I can't have all that you've got. I'm just joking. There's nothing wrong with those carb-free diets. Because I love carbs. I can say that. It's like saying, God, I'm a fussy eater. I'm a bit shy about coming to the table. God's saying, don't be fussy. All of this is for you. Prayer brings us to the table of all of the kingdom of heaven's resources. It empowers us to live supernaturally. It brings us to the one who has all authority and all power. Just look at the early church. When we read about God establishing the church in the first century in the book of Acts, we see a couple of examples of how prayer featured in the, in the wonder of what was unfolding as the Holy Spirit moved and, and began to blaze like a fire across the globe, of which you and I are the beneficiaries some 2,000 plus years later of the spread of the Spirit's flame. Here we are. In Acts chapter 1, we read this. This is the believers, the new believers. They all join together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They all join together constantly in prayer. Pray first. This is our first response. And then we read on. If you know the story in Acts chapter 2, we see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church is birthed in a profound way. And out they go with all kinds of supernatural things and supernatural gifts are going on and God is moving in supernatural ways and we see people surrendering their lives to Jesus. The church explodes with an explosion of joy. The mission unfolds and and God's people are involved in this process and they see supernatural provision and they see supernatural... I mean, there's a guy called Philip who's the first ever teleporter. I don't know how that worked, but we read about him in one place and it says the Holy Spirit whisked him away to Gaza. I don't know. He traveled hundreds of kilometers in a second. No, this is how the narrative reads. I'm not sure how God did that. We see a supernatural encounter with an Ethiopian servant of the queen, a eunuch. Like it's just supernatural stuff. In Acts 2.42, it says this about the new believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This was a natural rhythm in their life together as a community. Pray first. Pray first. Yeah? Friends, prayer is an incredible gift to us, and it is the great tether that brings all of our life and relationship together in Christ. Praying first is so, so important. You might have thought, how on earth, Adam, did you come up with, if we're doing several things that are first things first, how did you decide which was first in those first things? Anyone thinking that this morning? Like, okay, so we've got a few firsts. Um, There are some priorities we can have as part of an overall priority of putting God first. And we decided and we believe it's our conviction that pray first is amongst the most significant. It's the great tether in our life of connection to God, of connection to his resources. So we should pray first. Friends, when you get up in the morning, pray first. When you're deciding what you're going to wear today, pray first. When you're getting into your car and you have to merge into the motorway, pray first. When you get to the office or the place of work or the workshop or to school, pray first. When you're going out to a break and you're wondering who you might speak to, pray first. When you're getting on with uh, uh, all kinds of realities with your family, you're going to a family gathering, pray first. When you're about to eat a meal, pray first. Pray first. It's the great tether that weaves God into every facet of our lives. Pray first. And my friends, you don't have to listen to Adam's guarantee on this. I'm not offering you one. All I've done today is try to point you to where Scripture tells us, here is God's response. Pray first. Pray first. So friends, we're going to do that this morning. Sound okay? We're going to put first things first. God must come first. But we're going to take some time to pray. It would seem strange to have a message that's encouraging us to do this. And 
and then we don't do it. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me. And we're going to take some time to pray first. Because I don't know about you, but I know I have to continue to resolve to make this a habit. I need to continue to make this the norm in my life. It doesn't come naturally to me. But the more I do it, the more natural it becomes. And like you, I'm a work in progress. We want deeper and more relationship with God, don't we? We want the fullness of life that he promises. And here's the challenge. You might go, Adam, if I'm honest, I settle for the two hours on a Sunday immersion in the pool that God has for me. But I really want to go all in. I want to start wading deeper in the ocean of life that God has for me. Wade deeper. Let's wade deeper together. Let's go deeper. He's the way maker and the miracle worker. We'll sing that in a moment. So let's pause to pray, friends. Why don't we do that now? Lord, we come to you in prayer because we want to be a people who pray first. And Lord, out of this morning, we could go a couple of ways. We could be encouraged because the God of love has said, I want to be known by you. I want you to know my love. And I want deeper relationship. Or we could go down the road that says, this all sounds very legalistic, but Lord, we're hearing your grace call to us to put you first, that we might benefit. And receive all that your heart has for us. And so, Lord, in this moment, we give you this space. Firstly, Lord, we want to make space to just, if we need to, repent of times when we've put other things first. Lord, not with a sense of dread or fear from you, but with a knowledge that you forgive us already. You say that if we confess our sins, you forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, we just come and just say, look, we we know at times we actually drag other things and put them first and we're sorry for that. And while we're in this attitude of prayer, friends, if that's relevant for you, I'd invite you in your quietness of your heart to just Pray a prayer of repentance. Just let God know you're sorry and receive his forgiveness afresh and ask him to help you walk in a a pattern that fixes that. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace and your forgiveness. And Lord, we would ask that you would help us to develop this habit in our prayer life. Not for the sake of the habit, but for the sake of the relationship with you. Lord, thank you that you draw near to us. Lord, would you help us to create space as we pray first to draw near to you regularly. Lord, to live out the fullness of the supernatural life that you have made possible for us, to be free of, uh, of fear and anxiety, to know the depth and the wonder of your love on a more regular basis because it's there for us, fully available. Lord, would you speak to us about how you want us to do that, whether it's to grab a prayer guide that, that's available and make use of that, whether it's to carve a space and a place in our day to start our day with prayer, whether it's to get to a prayer meeting in the life of the church, whether it's to just find those moments all throughout a day. Lord, would you do that in our hearts, Lord? We're asking that you change us. Lord, this is not a simple, pithy prayer. Lord, change us, grow us, mature us here at Real Life. Each and every one of us, do it in me, do it in in our church family and across all of our ministries, Lord, mature us, grow us. So that we can wade deeper into the great ocean of life you have for us, Lord.
And friends, while we're in this attitude of prayer, as we're at the beginning of a year, there are a number of things that will launch soon. And so Calvary has its commencement service tomorrow in its 40th year, and there will be staff and some other visitors who will be here in this auditorium. And they will be commissioned and they will make covenant to walk out the call of God in the context of the college this year. And I want to invite you to pray for those staff members. And a simple way you could do that is pray over the seat that you're in and the staff member who might sit in that tomorrow and the seats that are around you. And ask God to meet with them and to bless them, to empower them, to encourage them as they start the year, that they might be people who put God first. And the overflow of that is that we create a culture and a community across the life of our college where students and families from our community who are yet to know the love and grace of God might discover they can put God first. What do you pray for them now in your heart? Pray over those seats. Pray over those staff. Ask God to bless them. Calm Holy Spirit. And again, at the start of a year, like yesterday, we had training for some of our volunteers who serve in ministries. And a number of our ministries will come back online in the next couple of weeks. You heard about Kids Life next week. And youth will come online in a couple of weeks. Young adults in in time to come. And life groups will begin to... What do you begin to pray for those things at the start of the year as they commence? Lord, we give them to you. We need you to move in those spaces and places. We put you first. God, they're just going to be programs if you don't inhabit them. We, We want them to be weekly encounters with the risen Lord. Pray a blessing on those ministries. Maybe it's the ministry you're involved with. Ask God that he might be first in that. Help, ask him to help you and your ministry area. Put God first. Bless that ministry this year. May it be all that God desires it to be. just as we round out our time in prayer before we worship, sing this song, Waymaker. Why don't you pray for someone or something in your life or in someone else's life you know about who needs God to make a way? They actually need a miracle or a breakthrough. Why don't you pray for that? Let's bring God first to that situation. Maybe you know someone that has a radical need that apart from God, we just can't see how it's going to work. Why don't you pray for that? It might be a financial need might be a relational need. Let's lift it to God. God, we need your resources on this. We can't do it ourselves. We need you, God. Move supernaturally in the midst of this stuff. Lord, thank you to hear our prayers, that when we pray, you hear them. Thank you for the image we see in Revelation of a bowl in heaven that you collect all the prayers in, Lord. Thank you for that beautiful image. Lord, would you pour out that bowl as you see fit in your purposes in our life and in our midst. Lord, we want to declare that we know you're here in our midst, that when we gather in your name, you're here. We thank you for your presence. And we know you're moving. You're moving in our church in 2024. We know that you want to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine in 2024. And we ask that you grow our faith and build our expectation. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to become worshippers in deeper measure. Waymaker, miracle worker, thank you in advance for all you're going to do as we put you first. In the name that is wonderful, powerful, and beautiful, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, why don't we... Stand together and sing.
as, as we've gathered here this morning, if you're here and if you'd like to receive some prayer, then Dan and I, we're just going to linger at the front. We'd love to pray for you. If you have never, ever in your life decided to put God first into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're feeling this morning like that's something that you need to explore or to do, we'd love to chat with you. Just make your way forward. Or if this morning you're here and you've done that, but you're like, you know, Adam, I'm... I've just opted for the shallow end I, or, I, or I was in the deep end and I just opt, I moved into the shallow Whatever it is, I've moved away. I want to go deeper. Then come and we'll just pray for you. Or get with someone who you know and trust here in the room before you go out to morning tea and just have someone pray for you in that and ask God for his help to draw you deeper and, and to move into that. We'd love to help you with that. If you did not grab a prayer guide yet, please feel free to do that on your way out this morning in the foyer. It's a green book. It's just a helpful tool uh, for you to use at your leisure. Grab a wristband to um, not tell the time for you, um, but to remind you just to pray first. And don't forget we have prayer meetings at 6 to 7 uh, all week, Monday to Saturday, with Saturday being at McDonald's Bryant's Road, uh, which was a different experience yesterday, but it was great. So... Um, those things, just a reminder, tomorrow night we have our church worship and prayer gathering here in the auditorium. And lastly, a reminder, 11.45 tomorrow. If you'd like to come and just be part of the commencement service for Calvary Christian College and their staff, 11.45 here in the auditorium. You're very welcome to be here. Bless your church. God loves you more than you know. Why don't you go out this week in the fullness of that knowledge? Amen.